Turn with me in your Bibles to Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. We're going to read the first two verses of chapter 1 and a handful of verses at the beginning of chapter 2. Now as we get started, let me point out, we're going through the Apostles' Creed. What does the Apostles' Creed do? It takes hundreds of Bible verses and central teachings and it boils it down to a handful of words. As someone who likes brevity, I like things like this. Now, this week, this sermon probably would not have been preached 200 years ago. They would have skimmed over God as maker of heaven and earth because it would have been an accepted fact. However, in our age of innovation, we rarely think about first things. We rarely think about basic principles. And yet it's these building blocks that are most lasting, most changing, most effective in our life. So let's pick up with our sermon in a sentence. I believe in God, maker of heaven and earth. Let's pray and we'll jump in. Almighty God, in the very beginning, you spoke and things were. And even now, you hold all things together by the word of your power. So I pray that this preached word would do just that. Renew a right spirit within us. Create in us a clean heart, O oh God. I pray that your spirit would be with the preaching of these words and the hearing of these words. We ask this in Christ's name. Amen. Let's pick up in Genesis 1.1. Hear the word of the Lord. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Now in chapter 2. Thus the heavens and the earth were finished, and all the host of them. And on the seventh day God finished his work that he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work that he had done. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy, because on it God rested from all his work that he had done in creation. And thus ends the reading of God's holy word this morning. Now as we turn to Genesis 1-1, let's ask a very easy question. What does the text say? And we're going to start by asking what the text doesn't say. First, Genesis 1, the creation account, is not a science textbook. Though I believe Genesis 1 is a historical factual account of the creation of the world, Moses did not say, let me pen a science book for little Hebrew boys and girls. Genesis 1 is not a science book. Genesis 1 is not a book of apologetics. I think Genesis 1 is useful for explaining to people the existence of God. However, Moses did not set out to explain the existence of God. To him, it was an already accepted fact. It's not a science book. It's not a book of apologetics. What is it? Well, if we turn in our Bibles back one page, we'll see two big words, Old Testament. Now, for you folks that have been here on Wednesday night, you know what a testament is. It's a covenant. What is a covenant? It's an agreement between two parties with certain obligations and promises. It's a relationship with parameters. Genesis chapter 1 is setting out who is our partner in this covenant. What is our relation? What are our obligations to him? That's what Moses sets out to do. And look, don't we see it? He is God all sufficient. We are man all dependent. He is God almighty. We are man most needy. He is God, maker of heaven and earth. We are man, his creation. 
Now, before we get too far ahead of ourselves, let's ask a basic question. What does Genesis 1 teach us about God? What does Genesis 1 teach us about God? I'm going to give you three things this morning. One, God is a God of wisdom. One is a God of wisdom. Does not the world beam with God's wisdom? God described this world as formless and void. And what we see is God is a master craftsman giving the world form and filling it. He creates the heavens on day one. Day four, he fills them with stars, sun, and moon. If I could put it in terms all of us who have ever moved can understand... God did not move in the furniture until he had painted the walls. Okay? He formed it and he filled it. Now you may say to yourself, Zach, if God's so almighty, why didn't he just do it? Why did he make it six days? God extended an instantaneous act to six days that we may say with Jeremiah. It is he who made us who made the earth by his power, who established the world by his wisdom, by the, his understanding, he stretched out the tent of heaven. God slowed the process down that we may see his wisdom at work. And Calvin was right when he called the world the theater of God's glory. I love reading Psalm 104. It sounds like somebody going on a walk through the woods, writing down all the things they see God do. He feeds the birds. He waters the hills. Let's think of my house. It's amazing the coyotes only come out at night, and God sends them away so man can labor in the field during the day. It's a great observation in Psalm 104. But even let's think of the south. Uh, it's the time of year for me where I buy a bag of sugar once a week because we have hummingbirds. When the hummingbirds first come in, there's not a lot of flowers, is it? But by the time they get on the nest and their population begins to blossom, so all the flowers in the field begin to blossom. That's God's wisdom at work. I read a doctor recently who said he's read hundreds of articles on how to repair the hand but not one on how to improve it. It's wisdom. Even Charles Darwin called the human eye his stumbling block because of its complexity. It's not a stumbling block to us. We know a God of wisdom, and he created the eye with such complexity to bear his fingerprints that it may serve as a tool that we may behold the wonders he has made. Everywhere we look, we see a God of wisdom. But we also see a God of wonder. God of wonder. Now what I'm about to say, I'm not anti-science. I love science, but let me tell you something. Science has killed our sense of of wonder. It has taken our joy out of this world. Science has taught us that things must be this way. The sun must rise. The clouds must float. Seeds must become fruit. That this world is a machine. But wisdom implies choice, doesn't it? Eudora Welty had her own style. And she was very peculiar about words. She couldn't use any words. She had to use that word because that word carried a certain meaning. She was an author, an artist, and she used the power of choice. Doesn't the same apply to God? Doesn't his power of choice, his wisdom, provoke wonder? Look at this world. The sun no more has to rise than I have to finish this sermon at 12 o'clock. 
Didn't in the book of Joshua, didn't God stop the sun? In Genesis 1, God scatters light from his hand long before the sun, moon, and stars appear. That's the God who is. Look at the sky itself. God formed it with his word and he holds it up by the word of his power. There are no chicken littles today because we have a big, a wonderful God. It's a God of wonder. What I have been tuned into lately is color. Color. The very colors in this room are intended to communicate something. God very easily could have made this world black and white and soundless like an old black and white movie. He has filled this world with color. Go outside of my office and smell the magnolias. Look at the red roses exploding around the water tower. Hear the sound of birds in the air. The mere power of choice, this wonder, should cause our hearts to melt in astonishment. Fruit and flower proceed in perfect pattern because God said let it be and it continues to be so. The greatest authors and artists in human history reach a period where they're tapped out. They hit a point of writer's block. But look at the richness of color. Look at the birds and the beasts, the fish and the fauna. There's an amazing sense of wonder in our God. One of the favorite paragraphs in my life that ever been written is by G.K. Chesterton. He writes of wonder when he says this. It might be true that the sun rises regularly because the sun never gets tired of rising. Its routine may not be due to lifelessness, but to a rush of life. The thing can be seen in children when they find some joke they especially enjoy. The child kicks his legs through access, not absence of life. And then the child says, do it again. And the grown-up does it again until he is nearly dead. A grown-up is not strong enough to exult in monotony. It is possible that every morning God says, do it again to the sun. And every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be because of automatic necessity that every rose at that water tower looks the same. It may be that God makes each one separately and he never gets tired of making them. It may be that God has the eternal appetite of infancy for we have sinned and have grown old and our Father is younger than we. God has a great great sense of wonder. He's the God of wonder. Do you not see it? Does this not lead us to what the inevitable conclusion that God is the God of wisdom, of wonder, and the God of worship? On day one, God created the morning and evening. He created light to tell morning and evening for what purpose? For worship. We go to day four, God creates the sun, moon, and stars for times and seasons, and yet when God says sun, he does not say the normal word for sun, he says the word menorah. And what's a menorah? If you went into the tabernacle or the temple, there would be a golden lampstand full of lights, and its purpose was to light the room so the priests could worship in a font as big as the sun, God is saying, this world was created for worship. And then we get to day seven, and what do we have? The Sabbath day. If I can paraphrase Michael Morales, Michael Morales says, the first sentence in Genesis is seven words, 
and then creation is told in seven paragraphs. And then on the seventh day, you have the Sabbath. And on it, God blesses it three times. Ding, ding, ding. Are we getting the hint? God takes Sabbath. He takes worship seriously. And Morales goes on. He says, humanity is not the climax of creation. It is the Sabbath. An engagement with God is what alone can fulfill the purpose and potential of man. God created this world with all of its well-ordered wonders. He created us to worship, that we may enter into the rest that comes with the presence of a wise and wonderful God. But let's look around. The entire world longs for rest, don't we? We have screens, we have sports, we have success, we have all sorts of other things that start with the word S. We use them as rest stops because we have little rest. And a plain reading of Genesis tells us why. Adam and Eve never made it out of day six. They never made it to day seven. They entered into sin, which brought them into servitude and slavery, which brought them, brought us into restlessness. We have been born into the same toil and trouble as sparks fly upwards. We no longer wonder at God's wisdom because sin has made us old. It has made our vision bleak. As Paul says in Ephesians 4, they're darkened in their understanding, alienated from the life of God because of the ignorance that is in them due to their, due to our hardness of heart. They have become callous. We've given ourselves up to sensuality, to greed, to every practice of impurity. We are looking for rest and we are not finding it. And it's at this very point in the Apostles' Creed, for this very reason, it goes into, I believe in Jesus Christ, our Lord. The very Creator is conceived in the darkness of the virgin womb, overshadowed by the Holy Spirit, just as in Genesis 1 and 2, that our Creator may become our Savior that he who formed man of clay veils his glory with clay that he may restore us to glory. From the very cross itself, the manifold wisdom and wonder and worship of God culminates in a dramatic fashion as, new man enter, as a fallen man enters into rest. Do you remember the Roman centurion in the end of Mark? He had a hard job. He killed people for a living. Do you know what that does to the human heart? It makes it very hard. Here is the sinless Son of God hanging naked and flayed upon the cross. He sees no wisdom. He sees no wonder. And when Jesus breathes his last breath, when they slide that cold, stainless steel spear into his side, the veil of the temple is rent, the representation of heaven is torn in two, and what happens? Suddenly he sees the wisdom, the wonder of God, and he worships. Truly, this man is the Son of God. It takes a Savior to restore these things in us. To those here who do not have eyes to see God's wisdom, Jesus offers us new sight, new spectacles. To those whose heart has grown dulled and lifeless, lifeless, Jesus fills us with the wonders and riches of God. To those whom idolatry has deformed and defaced, to where man is fallen to such a degree, Jesus makes us a new man. He gives us rest. He restores us to a pattern of worship.
We can find our greatest joy when we find him. So with one voice everywhere, Scripture says, I believe in God, maker of heaven and earth. But what in the world does that have to do with me? This is more than simply words we recite. There are things that shape our life. What does this require of us? Well, let's take those three things and turn them on us. One, we are to be a people of wisdom. We're to be a people of wisdom. Psalm 90 says, Teach us to number our days that we may have a heart of wisdom. We are called to live well-ordered lives. To the God who does all things decently and in good order, those united to him are called to do the same. Jesus says in John 9, Let us work while it is light. The day is coming when no man can, or the night is coming when no man can work. Paul says, redeem the time for the days are evil. To live our lives with no purpose, no plan, no pattern is a problem. We call it sin. Whether it be the student who meanders their time carelessly through the summer, whether it be the retiree coasting through life in the golden years, we are called to live a wise and well-ordered life. None of us lives to himself. None of us dies to himself. If we live, we live unto the Lord. And if we die, we die unto the Lord. If we are living lives that are disheveled, late and lost, we are living as the unwise, as the fool. So as Paul says, let us put on the new self and pattern ourselves after the image of him who created us. Let us be people of wisdom. Let us be people of wonder. Let us be people of wonder. Romans 1 details lots of negative things. But it starts with this. They knew God. But they did not honor him, nor did they give him thanks. They lost their sense of wonder. J.V. Fesco, in a book we're going to go through in Sunday school soon, says that we are an excitement-saturated culture. We have let our consumption rob our contentment, our wastefulness steal our wonder, God made heaven and earth for his glory, but he's only given us a portion, a portion for our good. We must ask ourselves some basic questions. Are we pursuing more because we are not satisfied with God? Are we filling God-sized holes in our hearts with screens, with entertainment, with busyness? Are we working long and tedious hours that we may feed an entertainment-saturated life? This world is a wonderful place. But as Christians, we are called to find our wonder, to find our joy in God and God alone. So one, we're a people of wisdom. Two, we're a people of wonder. Three, we're people of worship. Worship is built into the very fiber of creation. Time is never an excuse for not worshiping. God made time for that purpose. As someone once told me, we will always make time for what is most valuable to us. We make time for ball games, for vacations, for rallies. We take our children to far-flung places on the weekends and we're too exhausted to worship on Sunday. And then we say, Zach, why is my life so dysfunctional? Our lives are dysfunctional because we've had a breakdown at the most basic function, at the level of worship. We're trying to squeeze square pegs into round holes and we're wondering why everything hurts. It's not the way life was meant to be. The climax of creation is not balls, bushes, or budgets. The climax of creation is worship. 
if we're seeking a life of restfulness, a life of fullness, if we're seeking to get the most out of this world, we must first get the most out of God. I think C.S. Lewis summarizes it best. Aim at heaven, you'll get earth thrown in. Aim at earth, you'll miss both. We must aim for heaven. So in closing, let me rehash where we started. This is not a science book. It's not a book of apologetics. It is telling us who our covenant partner is. And this is a God who gives freely of himself. And freely, he invites us to be in covenant with him. He has shown us how to pattern our lives around him. And as we know, as we keep reading through Genesis, he has given us a son who patterned himself after us. That we may be a new creation, that we may pattern our lives after God. So I ask you, and I exhort all of us here, this creed that is so properly basic to the Christian life are not words we recite. They're lives we live. Are these words the form and fiber, the warp and wolf of our daily life? If God is the maker of heaven and earth, do we live as those made in his image? With that being said, let us pray. <clears throat> Almighty God, there, are so, there is so much in this world that glitters and gleams of gold, but you are most precious to us, most wonderful. I pray, Father, that you would give us eyes to see your wonder and everywhere we turn, on every leaf, every page of scripture, every leaf on a tree, every act of your providence in our lives and those around us. Help us to see your wonder and help us to live a life centered around you and the glory of your name. Father, do not let these words pass from ear to ear, but let them dwell in our heart. Give us a heart of wisdom, we ask in Christ's name. Amen.